Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. We know that when we study the Word of God, we don't study it for our information. We study it for our transformation. We ask in the name of Jesus, by the Spirit of Jesus, Lord, that you would illuminate our hearts, that we would see what you would have to share with us today. Help us, Lord, to hear from you and help me, Lord, to speak your word today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The title of our message today is called Fear of Connecting. And as we consider this attitude of the heart, another attitude, this is our sixth week, I'd ask you to think of this question and ask yourself this question. Is there someone in your life whose strength and wisdom and love encourage you to make yourself fully known? I want you to sit with that question for just a minute. Think of somebody. Is there anybody who, to whom you feel you can make yourself fully, completely known? That they love you so much that it doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what you communicate. It doesn't matter what you tell them. You know that they will love you. And you know that they'll stand by you you know that they will not leave you. That's the question we need to ask ourselves as we continue with our series on the attitudes of the heart. Remember what we're looking at are those attitudes in our hearts that keep us from connecting with God in the way that He wants us to connect with Him, but also those attitudes that keep us from connecting with one another. And I will tell you and guarantee you that by the end of my message today, I will persuade you and convince you that if you are not this person for somebody else or you do not have this person in your life, that you, like me, if that's true for me, that I am in violation of what Jesus has called me as a Christian to be. So let's think about that. And our theme scripture is Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And as we've talked about, we want to see God in one another and see him as he reveals himself to us. Our uh, scripture that we're going to be studying today is John chapter 13. And um, it's funny, I say this probably about just about every chapter, but this is one of my favorites. (laughs) This is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. And so it's chapter 13. And I'm going to read just a few verses from chapter 13 and then we'll unpack it. But I want you to think about the setting. The setting is that Jesus is completing his three-year ministry. He's with the disciples, his his closest friends, in the upper room. And that they're about ready to celebrate the Last Supper. They're about ready to share in this final meal. And so they're in the upper room together, the 12 apostles and Jesus. And... This is what chapter 13 says. Now, behold, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. So uh, understand what's happening. He says here that he's loved them to the end. He's now preparing to leave. And now he's going to do one of his final acts. One of his final acts of love he's about to demonstrate. But it says right before he does this, that the devil, it says, had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray Jesus. And we know who Judas was. Judas was the one who betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, remember? So this is Judas. He's already put it in his heart. Satan has already told him and tempted him, and he's given his heart to Satan. And Jesus knows this. So it says that Jesus rose from supper, He laid aside his outer garments. And let's picture this. He's wearing his normal clothing, and all of a sudden he stands up. He begins to take off his outer garments. 
And the apostles are probably wondering, what's he doing? Taking a towel, he ties it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin. I can hear the apostles whispering, what's Jesus doing? Should we help him? Is he going to wash the table? What's he going to do? Should, should we get up and help? And Peter's probably, no, just be quiet. Just watch and see. What's he going to do? So it says that he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. I mean, that's four or five words, but a lot is happening there. He begins to wash their feet and to wipe it with the same towel that's around his waist. And that culture, they used a non-Jewish slave to wash people's feet. And the feet were dirty. They wore sandals. They walked in dirt. They walked in mud. They walked in sewage. They were filthy dirty. And they were now sitting at the table, and presumably nobody had washed their feet. And here was Jesus now taking on the role of a servant, humbling himself. This is the Son of God. This was who they called Lord, who they followed for three years. He was their leader. Can you imagine Simon the Zealot who is there? What is he thinking? Simon the Zealot who probably thought freedom and deliverance would come through the military or through power and might. Here is Jesus, his champion, doing what a slave would do. Imagine you, Jesus washing your feet. How would you feel? I know me. My toenails are terrible. I would be embarrassed. <laughs> don't. I'm embarrassed. I, t- t- Joe, don't, don't, don't look. At, you know, I mean, can you imagine? Don't touch my feet. I, I, and Jesus is there. He's taking the water. He's washing the feet. And he's wiping it with a towel. And he's not rushing. He's taking his time. And each one is watching what he's doing. This is one of the last things he does. So think of the importance of what he's doing. How he waited till this moment in time to do that act of service. So he wipes them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. And then I would imagine Jesus proceeding to wash his feet. And then Peter says, "Uh, you, You shall never wash my feet. Uh, Lord, let me wash your feet. No, no, they probably had an argument, but we get most of it here, but this back and forth, don't, no, no, you can't. Yeah, Peter. And then Jesus says to him, Peter, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Wow. I can't, I have no share with you. I, I mean, I can't companion with you anymore. I, okay, Lord, Lord. Not my feet only, but also my hands and my head and everything else. Wash me all, Lord. You have all of me. Go ahead. I couldn't imagine life without you. And you're telling me, if, I, if you don't wash me, I can't have anything to do with you? That's unfathomable, unthinkable. So wash all of me. And what does Jesus say? He says, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. So think of the symbolism here, and we we need to understand this, that what Jesus is saying is that if we are not washed in the way he requires us to be washed, we will have no share with him. And the way that we are washed is by his blood. And we are washed one time. One time. That one washing unites us with Jesus forever. We call him Lord. We trust in him. We accept his sacrifice on the cross. He washes us from our sins, and we are with him forever. That's one washing. And so we never need to be washed again. But then he says, except your feet, you need to keep washing your feet. And that's symbolism as well. 
And we need to understand what he's talking about, and we will in just a minute. But then he goes on to say, do you understand what I have done to you? After he's done washing all of their feet. He says, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. If then, he says, your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. He set an example for them. And we need to understand, this was the first Christian church This was the first assembly of those who were following Jesus. They had followed him for three years. Think about them. Think about this society, this community. It was a community that Jesus put together, and but for Jesus putting it together, they probably would never want to spend any time together. Can you imagine Simon the Zealot? If it wasn't for Jesus, probably would have plunged a dagger into Matthew the tax collector's back. Matthew the tax collector. They, tax collectors were among the most hated. They were like lawyers back then. <laughs> <laughs> they were the tax, you were a tax collector? How could you? You were, you were a traitor to all of us. And here, Simon the Zealot, Matthew, the tax collector, in the same group for three years. Think about the relationship that they had with one another over those years, the things that they observed, the things that they did, and that Jesus led them into. This was the first church, and now he's telling them, I'm going away, but before I leave, I'm giving you an example, and this is among the most important. I'm waiting till the end to do it. So watch what I do. And then he says that you should also do just as I have done to you. Truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And the word blessed there means to be happy. Blessed, happy if we do what he says. Let's just break it down. Do what, he, what, what was he saying? To do what? To wash each other's feet. Okay. Now, we've got some uh, basins we're going to bring up. But no, I'm kidding. We're not going to do that. <laughs> but Jesus was talking figuratively and symbolically here. He wasn't saying, in church, you're going to wash everybody's feet physically. What he's saying is, what you, want, what you have to do for each other, if you are part of me, if you are my followers, if you are going to to love and serve me, is you have to act in such a way that it would be like washing each other's feet. You have to act like a servant. You have to act in a humble way. You have to get the grime and mud and dirt and filth off of somebody's feet with your hands. You can't do it from a distance, and you can't hire somebody to do it for you. You have to do it yourself. And guess what? You may even have to do it for somebody you don't like. Somebody who has caused you pain and harm. Did anybody betray Jesus worse than Judas? And the devil had already entered into his heart and Judas was at that table. And Jesus treated him like everybody else. So that's the church. That's who we are supposed to be if we are followers of Christ. But there are obstacles, right? There are obstacles to that kind of relationship, obstacles to connecting in that way. And we've been through them over the last four weeks or six weeks. We talked about the first one being a fear of inadequacy. But I am not capable. I don't know enough. They're talking about an issue that I know nothing about. I can't get involved in that. I'm inadequate. And so until I'm adequate, I'm not going to get involved. And that's called city building by Larry Crabb. And that we're, we're, in, we're in the process of building our own city in the way that we think it should look. And, and getting prepared and, and feeling like we are adequate or right. 
instead of kingdom building. And what we know is that God will not tolerate that. He will not let you depend on your own resources for very long if you are a follower of his. That he will take you into the desert and he'll say, you're at a place where there are no resources. Nothing except me. So either you depend on me now or I will take you to that desert. Because you, you, what he's telling you, just like a good parent, you don't understand what I have for you is so good, it is so wonderful that I'll take you through something right now that's painful to you to get you to that place where you see how good it is. And I'm going to take you through the desert so you will realize you can't do it without me. The other is fear of uncertainty. And that is the reducing life to manageable strategies. Saying I have to make everything in my life certain. I can't have any uncertainty, so I'm going to start managing it, and everything has to be reduced to manageable strategies. It's like fire lighting. Remember, we light the fire and we trust in that little flame as opposed to trusting in the light of the world. And God won't allow that either for his children. He's going to take us, as according to Larry Crabb, what he says, it must, he takes us through a deeper darkness. You keep lighting, I'm going to make it darker and darker where your light won't shine at all. Because you're not trusting in me. The third one was a fear of disaster. Where that is, we're afraid of the future. We're afraid of what may come. So we begin to build walls and we whitewash them to make them look better. And we think these walls are going to protect us. And we ask the question, am I safe? If it's not safe, I'm not going to do it. And it's not safe for me in every case to reveal myself to you. Because what are you going to do with my pain? What are you going to do with that truth that I'm telling you? Are you going to go and give it away? And No, I can't have that. I can't risk that, so I'm going to put up a wall. So you ask the question, am I safe? And what will God do? He'll take you to a place where you are not safe, where you completely have to trust in him in order to make you understand that this relationship that comes only through foot washing, only through connecting in that way, that that is the greatest thing that he has for us is connecting with him and with one another, that he will take us through anything to get us there. And the last one was the fear of emptiness or well digging, where we do not like the feeling of, of being empty, of, of feeling unhappy or, or dissatisfied. So we run to something to immediately fulfill us instead of going to God for that fulfillment and seeking him because he alone can satisfy our thirst. So those are the four attitudes that we were looking at, and we have to overcome those attitudes if they're in our hearts in order to connect with each other, in order to be the community of believers that God has called us to be. There is no question the body of Christ needs me. You can say this, the body of Christ needs me, and I need the body of Christ. And I'm going to ask you to repeat that after me. I'll say it, and I want you to say it. The body of Christ needs me, and I need the body of Christ. And that is true. Remember, the body of Christ is us, and every one plays a different part. And we cannot exist as he called us to exist without each other. Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. I want you to take a look at that. But as we look at Ephesians, um, this is a very important chapter. And I'm just going to go through it quickly, but it... It, um, Paul writes to the Ephesian church, and the Ephesian church loved Paul, and he loved them. And he writes to them, and he says, I, therefore, a prisoner from the Lord, uh, urge you to walk in the manner worthy of the calling which you have been called. So all of us, all believers, have a calling. That means that you have been invited by God to do something. He has called you, put his spirit in each of you. Remember, you're a believer in Jesus Christ. That means the Spirit of God, His Spirit, lives in you. Now, His Spirit in you is prompting you to do what He's calling you or inviting you to do. So he says, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. So it's bearing with one another or enduring with one another. It is not being alone. You cannot live or walk or be a believer alone. 
my wife has talked about this. Her father played professional baseball for the Philadelphia A's and, um, and uh, just a tremendous man and baseball player. But we talked about this. What would it be like if somebody came up to you, they had their uniform on, and then they were all dressed up, and they said, I'm a baseball player. And you said, oh, you are? What team do you play for? I don't play for any team. I'm a baseball player, though. Well, how can you be a baseball player if you don't have a team? Well, I like baseball. I love it. And I think I'm pretty good at it. But I'm not a member of any team. That would be ridiculous. It's exactly the same way with a believer. If you say, I'm a follower of Jesus, but I'm alone, I'm by myself, and I don't have, I'm not connected to anybody else. I'm t- given what Jesus has demonstrated in saying that we have to do as believers and be connected to one another, you have to be part of the body of Christ. If you were not, you were not part of the body. So it is, it is part of the definition of being a Christian. It is bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. And then he goes on to say, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip who? The saints. For the work of the ministry. That means, brothers and sisters, you. And yes, you are a saint. You may look yourself in the mirror and say, I don't look much like a saint. I don't feel like a saint. If you have the Holy Spirit in in you, Tim, you are a saint. You're a saint of God. And that's what he's talking about. That our job as pastors, and when I got to know this, I was happy. (laughs) Because what I realized is that my job is to equip you. To do the work of the ministry. Amen. That's what he says. Our job is to equip the saints. So every one of us is part of the body. We have a role to play. But you have to be equipped. You have to be taught. You have to be trained. But then go out and do the work that you're called to do. Um, it says, for the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. That's our goal. To be unified, unity of faith. So we have to be connected to one another. So with that, let's repeat this. We cannot do this alone. Let me hear you say it. We cannot do this alone. One more time. We cannot do this alone. That's right. Good. We can't do this alone. 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. Think about this. You are a priest. Every one of you is a priest, is a saint, is a priest, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous night light. That's your job and mine, is to proclaim his excellencies. And that's why we get excited on Sunday morning. We're proclaiming to one another. But the reality is he wants us to do that every other day of the week. He wants us to do that in homes, in each other's rooms or homes or places of work. And do you understand when they say, but I need the pastor to come, that you can say, I'm a priest. I'm a saint. I've got the Spirit of God in me. And guess what? The Spirit of God in me is about to touch the Spirit of God in you. So we have to open up to each other. Come into the presence of each other and wash each other's feet. Let that grime and gunk and dirt get all over you. And you know what? It's by God's grace. His grace that says to this person who's grunk, who's, 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 who's dirt and grime is all over them and they are embarrassed And they're saying, they're in shame. They can't reveal that to you. When you take them and you hold them and you love them in the midst of that, that's by God's grace alone. And what does that do to them? They just experience Jesus right then and there. 
Jesus just washed their feet. You know, my sister Darcy, she works with the elderly. And she, she does things that we hire people to do for people who can't take care of themselves. She cleans them up. She gets them dressed. She takes it when they spit in her face. When they punch her sometimes and they have Alzheimer's and they don't know who she is and they hit her. There's not enough money to pay for that. But she loves them anyway. That's washing their feet. That's loving them like Jesus loves. That's what we are called to do for one another. But what happens sometimes is that we don't see the things that keep us from being connected. We can't see it. We don't see it in ourselves. We don't see what God is doing in our lives. We need the help of others to see what we can't see. And with that, I'd like you to see this video. We can get to the boat through here. Ah! Wait, why are you running so weird? What don't I know? My old nemesis, Glass. <gasps> Birds can't see glass. Ah! <laughs> Just go, Tula. It's too late for me. You got the baby. You can deliver her yourself. What? No, I'm not leaving you behind. We can do this together. <laughs> Tulip, you got this. Okay, left, right, straight, straight, left, right. Oh no! I'm panicking! Uh, uh, right again! Oh. Left, left, I mean, left, right, right, right. into every piece of glass, some more than once. Oh, ah! <laughs> what are the chances of that? I guess pretty high in a glass factory. <laughs> and is that not true? <laughs> we can't see things sometimes, and we need others to tell us what's there that we don't see. And it's not just the bad things. It's the good things. It's to be able to say, but I see what God is doing. I see that you've matured. You've actually grown when you think you have not. I see God working in you. Yes, you know when you come to me and tell me that you feel ashamed about what you did? Well, that's the conviction of the Spirit. That's the Spirit of God. Sit with that. Listen to him. What else is he saying? And they encourage you. And encourage us. We need each other. We can't do this alone. We know that the vision here of the church is helping families flourish. Transforming lives through Christ. I can tell you families will not flourish. Lives will not be transformed through Christ if we are alone. And I'm telling you, I have no doubt. And, and whether or not you think this is an, envi an enviable position to be in as a pastor, I do. I think it's an enviable position, and I love it. But I tell you here, the reason why I'm here is because coming to this church 35 years ago, I came out of a family we were not connected. We hardly knew each other. I knew the Lord, and that was about it. And then I came here. And right away, I was pulled in to start helping and working in, in small groups. And men pulled me aside and talked to me and poured their lives into me and loved us. And then my family grew up here, and, and people poured their lives into us. We did life together. When I was struggling and couldn't make the mortgage payment, didn't understand how I was going to do it, they prayed with me and said, you can do it. God's there. You're not alone. Trust him. When our marriage was struggling, we were having difficulty at times to be able to talk to other husbands, and they said, look, you can do this. Let me tell you, this is what we do. Hey, why don't we come over, go out to dinner, let's talk, let's love one another, let's talk. And then I was encouraged. Well, they can do it, so can we. That's the body of Christ. That's connecting. That is washing each other's feet in love. And we need that. It's not enough that we come to church on Sunday morning. Families will not flourish if all we do is say, join us on Sunday morning, 
be loved and be well. And go off and try to make it on your own. We have to get into their lives. And we have to allow our, them into our lives. Whether we like them or not. It's not about what makes you feel good or who makes you feel good. It's what is Jesus saying and who is he calling us to be friends with. If, if Matthew the tax collector and Simon the zealot could be together, we can be together with others that we might feel uncomfortable with. Sin is any effort to make life work without absolute dependence on God. Absolute dependence on him. And we need each other to encourage us with that. You know, uh, Larry Crabb writes in his book a, a quote by Carl Jung, but I'd like you to ask yourself this question, though. I'm putting it more as a question than an authoritative quote. Did modern psychotherapy arise partly in response to the void in the Christian community left by Protestant insistence on private confession? Now think about that. The Catholic Church... They confess their sins to the priest, right? And I grew up Catholic. And many of you have a Catholic background or you're still Catholics. But I remember going to confession because my teacher, Sister Mary Jean, asked me, would ask me on Monday, did you go to confession? So I went to confession. And confession in the Catholic Church, if you don't know, is you go into a confessional, a small room. You sit down, it's dark. There's usually, there, at least there was when I was doing it. Maybe it's changed. But there was a screen there. You couldn't really see the, the priest. And he'd say, uh, you'd sit there and you'd say, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. And, and uh, it's been so many days since my last confession, and these are my sins. And you begin to tell him. Well, I remember going in there and saying, well, he might, under, he might recognize my voice, and I really don't want him to know. So, you know, I'm not going to tell him about the real bad stuff I did. Instead, I'm going to make up bad stuff and tell him about these things that I, you know, that I really didn't do. But, but he, he would probably like to hear them. So I make them up. And then I would go and i tell Sister Mary Jean, yeah, yeah, I went to confession. And then i think, i got to go back to confession because I just lied to the priest. <laughs> but my point is this, and this is what James tells us, right? James tells us in 5.16, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. So we have to confess our sins to one another if we are to be well and to be healed. But remember, that this, this quote was, might it be the case that we have so much need for therapy now, psychotherapies, because we're not listening to each other anymore? We're not going to one another. We're not allowing each other to tell us their problems or our problems to them. So what do we do? And even in the church, we say, if you have a problem, here's the number of your Christian therapist. Go see them. Instead of sitting with our brothers and sisters and saying, I love you, tell me. Maybe they won't need to go to therapy so much. Henry Nouwen, uh, a priest, a Catholic priest, who I've now come to really love. Uh, Mario has um, introduced me to him, but Catholic priest. And he writes, this is a quote of his. He says, I have been increasingly aware that true healing mostly takes place through the sharing of weakness. In the sharing of my weakness with others, the real depths of my human brokenness and weakness and sinfulness started to reveal itself to me, not as a source of despair. Not as a source of despair. Look at that. Not Sharing my weaknesses didn't cause me to despair, but as a source of hope. Because there's somebody else who then shows grace and loves you in the midst of your weaknesses. People, I, we need to understand that's the truth of Christianity. That's what it means to be a Christian, is to be Jesus for somebody else, to extend grace that only Jesus can extend. You can't do it and neither can I, but the spirit of Jesus in us can extend that grace to somebody and touch the spirit of Jesus in them. And then... They are strengthened and healed. As we finish up this morning, I just have a quote from the Connecting Book, and this is from Henry Nouwen, and this is what Larry Crabb um, quotes, and he says this. And he, he's trying to demonstrate, give an example of what it means to really connect. And he says, uh, 
spiritual writer Henry Nouwen, when relocation to a new ministry provided him with richer community, he experienced the darkest night of his soul. He left, I think it was Harvard, he was doing all these great things, and then he went to this community of disabled people who really didn't know him. And so Henry Nouwen writes, after many years of life in universities where I never felt fully at home, I had become a member of Le Arch, a community of men and women with disabilities. I had been received with open arms, given all the attention and affection I could ever hope for, and offered a safe and loving place to grow spiritually as well as emotionally. Everything seemed ideal, but precisely at that time I fell apart, as if I needed a safe place to hit bottom. That was the time of extreme anguish, he says, during which I wondered whether I would be able to hold on to my own life. Everything came crashing down, my self-esteem, my energy to love and work, my sense of being loved, my hope for healing, my trust in God. This is, this is a tremendous man of God, and this is how he's feeling. Everything, here I was, a writer about the spiritual life, known as someone who loves God and gives hope to people, flat on the ground and in total darkness. I experienced myself as a useless, unloved, and despicable person. Just when people were putting their arms around me, I saw the endless depth of my human misery and felt that there was nothing worth living for. All had become darkness. Within me, there was one long scream coming from a place I didn't know existed, a place of full of demons. And he says this, and with appreciation, he speaks of an elderly friend, a priest, to whom he turned. And he says, during the most difficult period of my life, when I experienced great anguish and despair, he was there. Many times he pulled my head to his chest and prayed for me without words, but with a spirit-filled silence that dispelled my demons of despair and made me rise up from his embrace with new vitality. That's what we're called to do for one another. That is the example that Jesus set for us. And if we are going to be the community of believers he's called us to be, we must wash one another's feet. And we know that he told us, Jesus did, they will know me by your love, right? They will come to know me by your love for one another. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we pray in Jesus' name that you would help us to love one another, to wash one another's feet, to allow our feet to be washed, to allow others into our lives, to be willing to open up even if we're hurt because we trust you, Jesus, and we see the spirit of Jesus in others and we want them to see the spirit of Jesus in us. We love you, Jesus, and we pray for your help. We pray that you would help us to love you more and to be connected with you and with one another in Jesus' name. Amen.